By 1954, the Burbank studio was buzzing with people involved in creating what would become Walt Disney's signature piece, his most ambitious enterprise to date, the creation of the world's greatest family theme park. Ellen Shaw was quickly enlisted for a key assignment. Walt came in and said, I want a map so I can point to it when I'm talking about Disneyland. Would, uh, I want you to paint a picture of the whole of Disneyland, what it's going to look like, as though it's from the air. So I got a big storyboard. We had storyboards about eight feet long and four feet high, and I painted the whole of what Disneyland would eventually look like on there. I was a busy little guy in those days. I could do... <laughs> I don't like to most, but I was very... I was very sharp. I could... <laughs> I've been taught how to paint, and I knew how to paint. I paint my head off. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. That's it, right here. Disneyland, seen from about 2,000 feet in the air and 10 months away. Eventually, it was Walt had it turned into a postcard. It was the first postcard sold at Disneyland, with Walt standing in front of it. As Disney sought sponsors for Disneyland, he convinced American Motors, the makers of Nash Automobiles, to contribute a unique travel film to be shown in Tomorrowland. The film would be 360 degrees in the round and filmed in the American Southwest. I didn't know it was going to happen, and I was called by his office saying, Walt wants you to go and choose the setups for going to Monument Valley tomorrow. Peter and his crew immediately left to shoot in the setting of so many famous John Ford Westerns, Monument Valley. Ub Iwerks had designed and built an 11 16mm camera rig which was mounted on top of a Nash Rambler station wagon for this first Disneyland Circle Vision film in deference to the sponsor called Sir Car Rama and the technical complexities of making all 11 cameras run in unison weren't the only challenge facing the filmmakers. The elements themselves often proved to be just as challenging, causing even the director himself to have to add a helping hand. We were going down a long stretch to the valley when a windstorm came up and a dust storm made it impossible to even dream of using the camera. They were kept covered. We then retreated and went to Las Vegas the first time. And in Las Vegas, I thought, gee, this would be a great place to shoot. We could shoot all the lights there, and we'd get a good exposure on that, even though the film was slower than those days. Las Vegas provided another opportunity for the Circa Rama crew. With the help of his friend John Hench, Peter was able to make arrangements to film the pool of the Desert Inn Resort and Casino. Certainly a very different and somewhat unique location for the family-oriented Disneyland. Then it was on to more natural locales, where the giant camera rig was taken up to film the Red Rocks of Sedona, all with an artist and his wife in the foreground, painting the magnificent scene all around him. Another sequence took the viewer to the sailboats and sun of Balboa Bay. Sir Karama opened with Disneyland on July 17, 1955. And all I had to do was go over there and say, yeah, let's shoot this bit and shoot that bit. And I got the credit. With the addition of a baby daughter, Linda Marie, the late 1950s proved to be a productive time for Peter. No longer considered just a mat artist, he worked with Fess Parker on the hugely popular Davy Crockett series, was a production designer on Johnny Tremaine, as well as a second unit director. Now in 1959, Walt Disney began pre-production on Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Walt knew that Ellen Shaw could convert the Disney backlot into rural Ireland. For his efforts, Peter would receive two credits on the picture, one for art styling and another for special photographic effects. The photographic effects would be achieved through set design and stage lighting, as well as some ingenious uses of the camera lens. 
Alan Shaw, along with Eustace Lysette, the Disney optical genius, created special effects the like of which no film-going audience had seen before. One of the nice things about Walt Disney was that he had great confidence in you once he got enough, if you could prove that you were worthy of it. And on this film, we did prove that we were worthy of it, I think, because on that uh, basis, he did not want us to go to Ireland. He said, we can do this on the back lot. We've got Peter. Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, that's, it was wonderful to have him say this. So we did it on the back lot. What I did was a lot of sketches to show, and that's why I got another credit. We got it all organized before we started the film. We knew exactly what we wanted to do, and we did it. As the character of Darby enters the realm of the leprechauns, complicated split-scale effects were accomplished as in camera shots. No post-production compositing was used for any of the sequences in the film. In addition to the complicated split-scale effects for the leprechauns, Peter again had to create from scratch the beauty of Ireland by adding painting to only dirt roads and partial sets. And we did that a number of times. In the countryside, you will think it's countryside. It isn't. It is not Irish countryside, and it has uh, these funny little mountains you get in Ireland with houses built on the top, or castles, as you'll see in it. And that was all prepared beforehand. A great deal of preparation also went into the creation of the sets and camera setups needed to make the actors playing the leprechauns appear to be only 18 inches tall. The process involved construction of vast sets using huge amounts of light and having Ellen Shaw's keen eye for matching. Often called forced perspective, this technique had been used in films before Darby O'Gill but rarely to such a successful degree. Well, in Darby O'Gill, there's a good way, a good example of false perspective, many good examples. What you do is build a set that will match onto a distant set, as though it's all part of one set. The foreground can be steps, for instance, and the distance have to be quite huge steps to match the steps, but also then the people would look very tiny in the distance. How can I give the order and me tied up in a sack? I'll throw you in the river and drown you like a kitten. So the two match. If you have an eye for matching, and then I had to get on the set, look through the camera, and make sure the set all went together, the distant set and the foreground set, before we put the characters. Then we have Darby in the foreground, and the little man sitting on the steps in the distance, and they're discussing something or other in the script. Now the night was dark and the mountain was covered with mist and the moon was no bigger than the light from a wee penny candle but it didn't hide him from me for there he stood with an angry little gob on him the king was supposed to be a quarter the size of Derby what I mean is that the camera is in one spot then you have Derby and from Derby, you have the Little King four times the distance of Derby is from the camera. So when you do that, you have to have it exactly right. Otherwise, the King occasionally looks like this size and then suddenly becomes smaller. All right, then. Wish your wishes and be done with it. I've work to do at home. Ah, don't rush me. Derby was played by Albert Sharp. And he was one of the Dublin players, as I understand it, as those of the Little King, and a number of other players in that film. But the difficulty for them was to pretend to be looking at the, each other when they obviously were one so far away and the other one closer to you. They couldn't be really looking at each other. So we'd find a, what we called a station point where they should be looking. So that was marked not on so that you could see it was out of vision of the of each player but they'd know where to look so they when they talk to each other they look at each other they both were so impressive i always think of darby because he was so great albert sharp also had to contribute to a number of illusions himself but perhaps the most impressive of all the shots is darby walking through the leprechauns as he approaches the little king walking on a platform reflected by a mirror into the cavern 
The texture and colors had to match perfectly to make the effect seamless.